Hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, workshop. My name is Ricardo Castellini. Uh, this is the fourth video of our, our media literacy series. Um, just give me a second here. I need to open a new file. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so I'm a media educator and this workshop, as you know, is part of, uh, of a media literacy series that I'm producing to promote an exhibition on misinformation called uh, The Glass Room, Misinformation Edition, which was put together by Tactical Tech. This, um, this exhibition should be available uh, uh, on the library, unfortunately, because of the restrictions, it's not available, but it is available online. So if you go to, to the library's website, you can get a link uh, to this uh, exhibition. And today, actually, by the end of this workshop, I'm gonna show you the link. I'm gonna show you some, some things that are in the exhibition as well. So this series is running for six weeks. This is the third week. Uh, every Monday, we have a new educational video that is uploaded to the library's website. And every Wednesday, we have a live online event like this one today. So last week, we had a workshop on fake news uh, that will be repeated on November the 25th, uh, the same time, 1 p.m. So in case you missed this one, uh, you have a chance to register and participate. Uh, and today the topic is digital privacy. If you know someone who would like to be here today, but for whatever reason could not attend this workshop, uh, we'll have the same workshop again on the first week of December, the same time when is the uh, 1 p.m. as well. Uh, so the, the, today the idea is to discuss how our data has been used by tech companies. And I'm also going to show you uh, uh, in practice how to better protect your data, some, some tips, of course. So if you have a device with you, and this can be a smartphone or a laptop or a desktop computer, whatever you have, <clears throat> excuse me, you can use it to follow what I'm doing uh, here. I'm gonna share my screen with you and I'm gonna do some, some things online. Uh, it's important to emphasize that privacy or privacy, if you prefer, is a very broad topic uh, with many different subtopics and areas. Uh, so I'm going to discuss privacy from a media education point of view, okay? Uh, I'm not a technologist or a computer scientist. My area of expertise is media and communication. So just to make sure that uh, I will touch on this topic, but from a um, um, communications point of view. Um, and if you ask something, if you have any doubts about what I'm saying today, and I don't know the answer, uh, which sometimes happen because, as I said, you know, this every day we have new things coming up, and so I, I can't follow everything. Uh, I will ask you to please leave your email address, and then I'll try my best to find the answer and send it on to you. Okay. As you know, your video and sound are, are turned off, uh, but you can still participate through our our chat. So if you have any questions and comments, please uh, send it on to us. I'm gonna now share my screen with you. And the first thing that we're going to do today, I'm going to play this video. It's a very short video. It takes only about three minutes. It sounds appealing. While barely lifting a finger, you set your thermostat, start your coffee maker, turn on the lights, fire up your favorite playlist. But what if the price of that convenience is your private information? Starting to sound a little less appealing. All of those connected gadgets carrying out all these useful jobs are part of what's become known as the Internet of Things. And their increased prevalence in everyday life is forcing everyone to consider a fundamental give and take, comfort or privacy. Tech companies, wireless carriers, and all manner of startups are racing to connect whatever they can, and the benefits have been self-evident. 
Smart speakers can answer questions, order groceries, or book a reservation. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Electronic monitors can let patients leave hospitals sooner or allow seniors to live at home for longer. LAQ, tell me what the weather is today. Looking forward, the worldwide adoption of 5G mobile technology will allow more IoT devices to talk to each other without human intervention at previously unreachable speeds. That means homes that look after themselves and cars that take over the driving. As far as industrial applications, think smart factories and warehouses that can fulfill their own orders or notify supervisors to problems. And yet all this promise comes with potential downsides for the customers who own these devices. First, there's security, or the lack thereof. Even if individual IoT devices are secure, more devices means more vulnerabilities. In one such example, hackers accessed the digital thermometer in a casino's aquarium and worked their way from there through the casino's network to gain access to its database of high rollers. Things start to get scarier when you imagine malware infecting a self-driving car or a surgical medical device. Other worries concern business practices that are perfectly legal if not well known. Smart factories could be smart enough to track an employee's every move, including trips to the restroom. Health trackers collect blood pressure and heart rate information, but what if that gets shared with your insurance provider? It's not unthinkable that a company would sell information about a customer's personal habits gleaned from one of its devices to advertisers or even to hostile governments. And there are already examples of potential misuse, including 2019 reports that Amazon employees had listened to recordings of customers using its Echo devices. There's also the question of utility. Does your baby really need a smart diaper? Does your pet need a smart door? Does the function of all these IoT devices make up for the increased electronic waste that they create? Maybe we should ask Alexa. I don't understand. Okay. So I think it's very interesting the way, you know, this, this topic is framed in this video, uh, comfort ver versus uh, privacy. Um, I think we, we've been so accustomed to, to use free online services that we even forget how amazing it is that we, we don't have to pay for them, right? Uh, we, we usually pay for the physical stuff, like you, you buy your mobile phone or you buy your laptop and you're happy to pay for that. But we usually don't like to pay for apps, for example, or for services that we use online when we are, for example, on, on, on Facebook. Think about Google Maps. We don't pay for Google Maps. You know, you can go anywhere in town. If you like to travel like me, you go to any, any or almost any place in the world. And you can, you don't even need today to plan out in advance where, where you're going because you get there and you can use Google Maps to go anywhere. And it's quite reliable and you basically you don't pay for this you know you're paying for your phone but you don't pay you're not paying for this service uh the same like the content in social media platforms you can share your photos you can share your data you can communicate with people and you just don't pay for that i remember for example the first time when i came to ireland 10 years ago i used to call my family uh through the phone that's the way we used to do this. Nowadays, I only use WhatsApp mainly, and it's free. And, and, and I can send pictures, I can send links, I can send texts, and everything is for free. So usually, we, we don't pay for these kind of things. But, um, but as you know, nothing is for free, right? Uh, uh, some, if something is free, usually we, we get a little bit uh, uh, suspicious about it. Uh, um, and I'm sure you have heard the expression, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. So of course, it's not totally free. We are giving something to these companies and this something is our data. Um, so I'm gonna give you some numbers here that I think are interesting just to start off the conversation about data, uh, online data mainly. So active internet users nowadays are around 4.666 uh, uh, billion users. Unique mobile internet users, 4.28 4 billion. Active social media users, 4.14 4 billion users. That's a lot of people. I mean, the world, I think nowadays we have 7.8 billion people living in the world. So we're talking a lot of people. 
Um, we have around 2.2 a quintillion, which is one plus 18 zeros bytes of data are produced by humans every day. 463 billion gigabytes of data will be generated each day by humans as of 2025. 95 million photos and videos are shared every day on Instagram. 90 million photos a day. That's too much. By the end of 2020, 44 trillion gigabytes will make up the entire digital uh, universe. And the last one, 300 billion emails, 300 billion emails and 500 million tweets are sent every day. So can you imagine the amount of data that we are producing uh, uh, on the internet? And we are all helping these data, right? Uh, uh, every time you go online and you, you post something on, on social media, every time you type something on Google, every time you post a picture, you are contributing to, to the same thing. Um, so uh, basically we have three types of data, right? I'm just gonna show you something else here, just a second. So basically uh, we have, to, we, we, we usually we frame the situation uh, in terms of three types of data that we give away to, to tech companies, right? The first one is called the personal identifiable uh, data. This data is, is the data that usually we give out, for example, when you fill out forms, right? So you give your name, you give your, your date of birth, you give your, um, your uh, gender. So this is usually uh, 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 information that when you, when you have to subscribe for something, you go there and you give your address and everything uh, uh, to these companies. The second one is what we call the engagement data. So this type of data are collected when, for example, you go to a website and then the company can know how many times you went to a certain page, uh, how you click, you know, so they have, uh, it's a little bit more refined data, but it's not as refined as the third one that we call behavior data. So this data is, uh, uh, is the one that reveals some, let's say some underlying patterns of our usage. So this can include, for example, the way we click, the way we move the mouse around the screen, uh, um, how you look at the screen, your attention, so they can capture all of this. So you see that there is a, a degree, a hierarchy of, of uh, uh, refinement, we can say about this data. The, one is the, the first one is the most simple one. Of course, that about personal identifiable data. There are some data that are, there are, some data that are uh, sensitive information, we can say, for example, your driver's license number, uh, your bank account uh, details, which are information that you, you don't want anyone to see, but this is considered as well as personally identifiable data. So we have these three types of data that we usually give away. Uh, and how do tech companies, they, they collect our data? Again, the first, the first way is by directly asking us and we give information. We are so happy to give information if you stop to think, you know, when we go online, we give information to all these companies very easily for free. So if we are asked to fill out a form, if we need to register for something or subscribe for, for something, we go there and we give a lot of information to these companies. Uh, every time you, you post a picture, um, every time you, you text something, you are giving information to this company. So this is the first way. The second way is uh, what we call indirectly tracking us. So what happened is every time you go online, you leave certain, some, some traces on the web every time, okay? And actually most of the time we are consenting about this, uh, even though of course we almost never read the private notice. Uh, uh, so the websites, for example, they store cookies. I'm gonna talk about cookies uh, uh, in a minute. But that's, that's, that's the information that we call that they, they are tracked indirectly. So for example, uh, cookies, uh, every time you type something, uh, cook, cookies actually, if you don't know what cookies is, cookies are, are kind of strings of, of letters and numbers that help the website remembers me. So they're very useful, okay? Uh, I think the cookies were invented, if I'm not wrong, in 1994. 
And if, if it wasn't for cookies, for example, every time you sign up uh, on a, or sign in on a website, like a newspaper, if you have a subscription in an online sub, uh, a newspaper and you go there and you sign in, uh, if you come back to this newspaper later on the day, you don't need to sign in again because the cookies are there and the cookies, you know, uh, uh, make the website remember you. So you don't need to, to do this again. And cookies are used for, for many different uh, 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 reasons. So for example, every time you go, you go on Google, Google stores information about you. The same on Facebook and any, or any other uh, social media platform. So they know your preferences, they know the places you visit, uh, they know people you like, people you don't like, uh, the products and services that you, that you prefer uh, and so on. Uh, uh, so the second thing is about social media and search engines. The third thing is what we call heat maps. So heat maps is basically, uh, it's a technology that allows these companies to, to collect some, some of the behavioral information I, I mentioned before. So for example, um, we have hover maps. So hover maps are basically when uh, they show the areas where people have hovered over a page with the mouse. So let's say you're gonna buy a shoe and you go to a shoe shop website, and then you, you some shoes you prefer, so you go there with your mouse and you click and you, 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 you hover over, so they can actually see that you like that shoe, even if you don't buy it, even if you don't click actually, just by hovering over, they can actually understand that you like that type of shoe, and that information is collected, and that information is later on shared with other partners, so other partners will know that you, you like that kind of shoe. Uh, also, we have uh, uh, the click map, so they can actually tra track when you click on something. So if you're not only hovering, but you click on something, they know this. Uh, the attention map as well, so which areas of the page you spend more time on. So they, they know that, you know, if, for example, you were reading a text, so they know that you, you were reading that text for some reason. And they scroll maps as well, which is basically when you are scrolling down uh, a page, so they know how far you went down that page uh, uh, or if you just stopped in the beginning and so on. Uh, another thing is GPS. This is very uh, familiar uh, uh, with us. I'm sure you have ex already experienced the situation where you, you download an app, for example, and then uh, uh, it appears the message, the app wants to know, uh, um, wants to know and use your location. And usually we say yes, right? Uh, so your location and movements are being tracked all the time. Uh, in the last one that I put here, there are more, okay, I'm just giving you some examples. It was, it's what we call the signal trackers. So for example, stores, they can track the signal on your phone to collect data on your journey inside the store and make decisions regarding the layout and special offerings. So they know which places of the store you've been to and which places you, you spend more time on. So they can think, okay, so maybe we should change the layout of the store because you know this we know that the people go a lot to this place but they don't, they don't go to other places so they can actually manage that and these are just a few types of uh, um, uh, ways that they, they can uh, collect our data and the last one is by acquiring our data from other sources so these we have what we call the the third party cookies third party cookies Actually now, uh, uh, third-party cookies are, are cookies that are set by a website um, other than the one you are currently on, okay? So for example, let's say you have a website, then you can have a like button. You, you have a website, you set up a web, website yourself, and then you can put a like button there on your website, which will store a cookie about the user, okay? So every time the, cook, the, the user go there and click on the, the like button, you're gonna store that information. And that cookie can later be accessed by, a, for example, a social media platform such as Facebook uh, 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 to identify the user and see which websites he visited. Uh, 30, uh, uh, that's actually how digital platforms can track your traffic and, and, and the sites you visit and, and, and so on. The use of 30 part cookies has been very controversial. And a lot of websites are actually stopping to use them. Google 
uh, announced that by, I think by 2022, they will stop using uh, third, party, third party cookies. Which doesn't mean, of course, that uh, uh, this is the end of tracking. Uh, we don't know exactly how they're going to do that. We know that there are some other ways of doing this, but we don't know how they're going to do that. But they, they are saying that they are not going to use third party cookies anymore. So if you go to a Google device, uh, the, your, your data will be stored there so they can still use your data, but other companies will not have access to this data in this way, at least that we know today. And of course that these companies always find a way to track our data uh, uh, in a different way. For example, Facebook used something called uh, a pixel tracker, which works more or less like the same way of the third party cookies, okay? So this, this uh, pixel is a kind of uh, analytic tool that allows uh, to measure the effectiveness of your advertising uh, uh, by understanding the actions people take on the website. So if you, I'm going to show you actually in a minute how you can, you can do this um, on practice. I'm going to, to the Facebook webpage and I'm going to show you how you can segment your, your users. Um, so why do tech companies collect your data? So the first thing we, we I talk about was uh, how they collect your data, but why do tech companies uh, collect our data? Well, according to them, they collect our data to make our online experience more personalized. That's the explanation they give to us, which is not, which is not a lie, it's true. I mean, they, they actually give a very personalized experience for us. So for example, when you go to Google and you type something on Google, Google has stored a lot of information about you. So the results you're gonna see on Google are based on your personal preferences. If, if I type something on Google and you type the same thing on Google, you're probably gonna get different results because we have different information stored on Google. The same on Facebook. If you go to your Facebook uh, uh, timeline or if you go to your Instagram timeline, that timeline has been specially tailored to you. The experience you have on Facebook, it's, it's your experience. It's completely different from my experience, your friend's experience, because it has been tailored to you. Uh, according to your personal preferences. So Facebook knows you. Facebook knows, for example, that you like vintage cars. So it's gonna, there, there's gonna be a lot of videos about vintage cars in your timeline. In my timeline, there, there will be none because I don't like vintage cars. So the experience is it's tailored to you. So this is, this is true. They, they create a very, a very uh, uh, personal experience for us. But of course that there's another reason for that. And the other reason is the business model. So uh, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you, you pay for the content uh, they provide with something, and this something is your data. So if you're not giving money to them, of course you're giving something, you know, of course that they're not gonna creating all this content for free, you're giving your data. But why they need your data? Well, they need your data because they're the real customers of these companies are the advertisers. So this is a, here you can see a very simple graphic about how the, the business model, um, how the business model works. But may, basically uh, the tech companies use people's data to segment their users and provide advertisers with a very detailed information about users' preferences. That's why they need their data. So they don't sell your data directly to advertisers, where at least we, we don't know that. I mean, we, we believe they don't do this. Sometimes there's some problems with data. You probably remember uh, the Cambridge Analytica problem, uh, which was according to Facebook, they didn't know anything that was going on, but, analyt uh, but the company actually used an app to access a lot, of, uh, a lot of data from Facebook users without the consent of Facebook users. But anyway, but they, they don't sell this data directly to, to, to advertisers. But what they do is they use this data to provide a very segmented target to advertisers, which is one of the most precious thing that advertisers can have. You know, if you know your, you, because let's say that you have a company that sell, uh, I don't know, guitars, and you, you, know, the, you, know, how uh, you know the profile of your audience, 
So can you imagine you go to any publisher and then you, you just say, you know, my, 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 my users are, I don't know, 75% women uh, between 30 and 40 years of age. Uh, uh, and they usually like, of course, they like music and they like this kind of specific like of users. So I just want to target this kind of people. You go to Facebook, for example, and you can do that. Uh, um, I'm going to show you now quickly one, one example of this. So this is a, if you, if you have a Facebook page, uh, uh, a business Facebook page, not, not a personal one, if you have a basic uh, um, Facebook page, um, a business, sorry, a business Facebook page, you have access to this page here. So this is when, let's say that I, I have a, a business uh, and I want to promote my business on Facebook, okay? So I can come here and I'm gonna choose my goals. I'm gonna put like, uh, you can choose between get more uh, website visitors, get more messages, promote your page. So I'm gonna, I want to get more website visitors, okay? Especially because it is recommended by Facebook, by the way. So I click here and uh, I can actually come here to audience. Who should see your ads? And I can segment this the way I want. For example, I'm just gonna show you very briefly how this works. So I click here and let's say that I'm going to choose women uh, between 18 and 41 and location. Uh, I can go here to the map and I'm gonna choose Ireland. more specifically Dublin. Uh, and then you see, you can choose the area that you're gonna, you're gonna uh, target. So I'm gonna choose this area here. And then I can browse, for example, people in terms of education. So universities, I'm gonna, I just want people that study in DCU. That's fine. Okay, so I can find here and all, only people that study communications on this year, in this year. And here it is. Uh, I can go to financial and income, household income, 10% of ZIP codes. Uh, this is just for US. Some things are just for the US. Life events, people living away from family, date of birth, upcoming month, uh, birthday, a uh, new job. And even if I type here something like sports, so I can have sports car, people who are interested in sports car. So I can keep going and segmenting the way I want. And Facebook only has all this information because we gave to them, you know, we gave to Facebook all this information or they collected in some way all this information, right? So, uh, so that's just an example of how this, this uh, uh, works on, on Facebook. Let me come back here to my presentation. So then we come to, to the idea of privacy notice. I'm sure every time you go to, to a lot of websites, you get a privacy notice. Uh, but who reads the privacy notice, right? Um, uh, there's a, uh, I found an information that actually, if you, if you, we, 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 we give our consent to most of the data companies collect from us. So do, do you guys read all the private notice you come across? I guess not. Uh, just to give you an idea, PayPal, you know, PayPal, the, 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 the monetary service, uh, they, they have uh, the privacy notice of PayPal has more than 35,000 words. So how are you gonna read that? I mean, you have to, of course, if, if you're subscribing to, to PayPal, you, you have to read, but it has more than 35,000 words. Some estimations calculate that it would take us 30 full days a year to read all the private notice uh, we come across. So we simply uh, uh, don't, don't read them, you know? Uh, and because we don't read it, 
we don't know exactly what they're going to do with our data. So sometimes we know the devices are using our data, while in other situations, we don't know exactly what's going on. And this is why now there's a lot of discussions about it, you know, because people are saying that uh, uh, even though you have to have this privacy notice, of course you have, but you have to make this easier for people to read. You have to make it smaller. So uh, uh, there's a lot of discussions about how you can improve actually this access of information. Uh, um, and this is one way that we can actually regulate the, the sector. We have, in terms of regulation, here in, in Europe, we have since, uh, I think, May 2018, if I'm not wrong, we have the G GDPR, which is, uh, um, it's, a, it's an European Union law um, that gives more protection to people. I'm going to show you here the website. So here is the website, if you want to have a look. If you want to go there and just have a quick look, um, the only problem is that you're going to have to read a lot because you see there's a lot of different sessions here, different articles. So, uh, but here it, it explains very well what we're talking about. There's a lot of, of other regulations um, being prepared right now. Okay. I'm sure you probably have followed. Um, what's going on in the US. So uh, a lot of tech companies are being invited to, to talk with uh, um, policymakers about, you know, about regulation, about how we can improve this, uh, especially related to, to data protection. So there's a lot of things going on in terms of how to make this space a little bit safer for everyone. Uh, the problem is that we, we give out a lot of information but we also benefit from this, right? So it, that's why it's kind of a tricky situation because like, for example, cookies, if you, if you don't want to have your cookies stored, you can do this, you can select this. I'm gonna show you in a minute how you can do this. The problem is that if you don't have your cookies on the website, this will have a bad uh, uh, consequence for you as well. So on the one hand, it's, it's safer because you're not giving out too much information to these companies. But on the other hand, your online experience will, will be severely undermined. So the discussion that we have now is how we can actually find the balance between giving some information that we are fine to do it, you know, we're okay to give some information, but we don't want the companies to actually use the, this information in a way that can be harmful. And what is harmful? Well, harmful is if, first of all, you don't know that your information is being, uh, is being given away, for example, to, to companies that you don't know, uh, or if they are being used for political reasons. You know, if you start receiving some political advertisements and you don't know where they're coming from, uh, well, somebody, somebody that has access to your information gave this information to a company and this company sold this information to another company. And now you are receiving these ads in your in your social media platform or or any other device. So regulation is something important. It's it's a very difficult topic. It's a that topic that we've been discussing within academia, within the civil society, and a lot. There's a lot of players involved in that. But that's something that we, I mean, we can't just uh, um, we can't just avoid. We we need to discuss. So in terms of safety. I can show you some practical tips to, to protect your data from, again, from a communications point of view. So I'm going online again. And uh, one thing that I think it's interesting, for example, uh, let me just refresh this page. I'm here on the Guardian website. You see there's, a, there's an ad here, right? If I click on add choices, this is person media ads, but it could be something different. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going back. I'm gonna refresh the page again. That's a different website, that's a different ad advertisement. Add choice, this is the same. I just want to see if I can get a, 
one Google AdSense. Oh, here we go. So click here, add choices. Or if I actually click to, to close the ad, ad, Google is gonna ask me why this ad or why I'm seeing this ad here. If you click here, you're coming to this page, okay? This ad is based on your visit to the advertiser's website or app, websites you visit. So actually Google is explaining to you why you're seeing this ad. You can stop seeing this ad if you want, or you can make ads more useful to you. Go to add settings, and then you can click here on add settings. And you can personalize your information. Look what Google says here. Google makes your ads more useful on Google services and on websites and apps that partner with Google to show ads. And then you can click here and see why you're seeing these ads and so on. How your ads are personalized. So you see here between 35 and 44 years old. So that's me, a male. And here there's a lot of things that are related to my preferences. Okay. So Google actually is not hiding this from us. It's not, it's not on the web page, but if you, if you know the settings, you can actually see how the, and look how many, how much information there is here about me, you know? All this information is related to Ricardo. And if I click in one of them, Google estimates this interest based on your activity on Google services. So Google explains a little bit to us how they use our ads. So if you want to learn a little bit more about how your data is being used by, and this is only Google, okay? Because Google, Google AdSense is the major player in, in this market. So I think it's, it's useful to go to Google and see, but Google is not the only company that does that, but it's the main one. I'm not sure about the market share of ads, but I think Google AdSense has between 60 and 70% of the share in the market nowadays. So it, it's a big player. So here you can learn a little bit more about how your data is being used and you can, you can personalize this as well. So for example, let's say you, are, you, st you, you started to receive a lot of ads that you don't like, you know, about a topic you don't like. You can come here to Google and you can set up this. So you will stop receiving these ads from Google, not from other companies, but at least from Google, you're gonna start, you're gonna stop receiving uh, these ads. Um, let me show you something else here on Facebook. So see this ad here on Facebook. Well, it's a Google ad, but it's on Facebook. So I can, I can hide the ad, report the ad, save link. Why am I seeing these ads? So if I click here, it gives me a lot of explanation as well. So Google is trying to reach people who Facebook thinks are interested in Facebook marketing and more. Google is trying to reach people who Facebook thinks are in a category called Facebook and page admins. And as you click, you get more information and you get more details about why this ad is appearing to you. So you can start learning a little bit more about how this business model works. And this is crucial for understanding how, uh, how and why the digital media technologies collect our data. Because otherwise we are only gonna think that, well, they collect our data because they won't personalize our experience, but it's not, it's all about the business model. And of course, I, uh, I don't have time to go through the business model today, uh, the video that we uploaded uh, two days ago on Monday uh, about media literacy on the library's website, uh, on this video, I discuss a little bit about the business model and explain uh, how the, our data is used. And I, 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 I talk about this, this uh, personalized experience online. So if you, if you have a chance, it's a very short video. It is uh, 15 minutes long. And the video next, next week, uh, I will also discuss a little bit about the business model. So if you want to have a look at that. Uh, and I'm going to show you something else here. It's about our, our cookies and preferences. So here I am on Chrome, okay? Uh, other browsers have the same features. I'm not going 
to all of them today. So I'm just using Google today, but all the other uh, browsers have similar features. So here in Chrome, if you go to preferences and then you go to privacy and security. So there's a lot of data here. There's a lot of information about you and how uh, Google Chrome uh, collects your data and how it keeps your data. So there's a lot of things you can go through here. So for example, here you have all the cookies and um, and site data that they stored from you. And see here, they give you a chance to allow all cookies. And then they explain to you what's going to happen if you allow all cookies. And then you have this option here, which is block third party cookies. Remember, I'm, I was talking about the third party, uh, uh, third party cookies. So if you don't want Google to share your third party cookies, you can come here and enable this, uh, um, this option. So Google will stop completely sharing your third party cookie. Or you can actually block all cookies if you want which they say is not recommended. And personally, I, I also believe it's not recommended that you, 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 you block all cookies. I like to have some, some personalized experience online. I, I wouldn't like to go online every time I go to a magazine or a newspaper website that I have subscription to, to sign in again all the time. You know, you go to Facebook, you have to sign in, you go to Instagram, you have to sign in. And, 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 and other features that the cookies provide to you. So I keep my, uh, uh, but this is very personal, okay? You do whatever you want, of course. I keep my cookies habilitated. I just block the third party cookies because I don't want uh, Google to share these cookies with other companies. And if you, if you go to this privacy and security again, there's a lot of information here. Um, it's easy to understand and you can, get a little bit more uh, familiar with how this, um, this, this business model works. And finally, I just want to suggest that uh, this is the, the web page of the Glassroom, the exhibition that I was mentioned before. I hope this is not a spoiler, okay? I hope you go there and visit the, 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 the exhibition. The exhibition is amazing. There's a lot of different things you can see on the website. I like this first one here, Data Detox Kit. If you click here, there's a lot of interesting information about, for example, seven tips to detox your data. Uh, so uh, with very, very useful information about how you can actually, um, it's, because you know we, we spent so much time today on social media uh, we spend uh, so much time today looking uh, at our phones and devices. So in, uh, here they explain to you some, some, some ways of avoiding spending too much time in front of the computer, in front of the screen, in front of our mobile phones. Um, there's this part here that I think it's very interesting. It has a lot to do with what we were discussing today. Hide and seek on your feeds. So how algorithms influence your information. So there's a lot of things about what we discussed today, but a lot of things in more detail. Um, and uh, so I really recommend that you go there. It's the link. You, if you just want to go straight away, it's, uh, it's at, let me go here, um, datadetoxkit.org. But you can go to the library's website and you're gonna find the link about that. Um, so again, we end up discussing the, the, how we can actually square this, this uh, uh, equation between uh, comfort and privacy. Because again, if you, the more comfort we want to have, the more data we have to give away. There's no secret, there's no magic here. If you want to have a very personalized experience, you have to give your data. You, you like that you can use Google Maps when you are on the streets, but you're giving your data about your location to Google. Google knows everywhere you're going, it, the places you're visiting and everywhere. You want to share your information on Instagram. You like to share photos and stories and everything. That's great, but you know, Facebook who owns Instagram knows where you're doing, what you're doing and everything. So I think now we are in a very crucial moment where we are debating this balance 
what kind of information we want to give to companies. Uh, of course, that we want to have our sensitive information protected. And to do this, what I recommend is be very careful with your, your passwords. Uh, don't have the same password for everything, especially for things that are really dear and important to you. Um, uh, uh, don't ac if you access, if you have to access a, com a computer in a public place, be careful with the kind of information you are, you are giving there. Um, oops, sorry. And uh, so there's a lot of deep, you know, small things that we can do to protect our data. Nowadays, we can't protect everything unless if you're not online. And this is a choice for many people. I have some friends that simply gave up going online and they don't trust the internet anymore. They don't trust the social media platforms. Uh, they simply don't, you know, they don't, don't share anything. This is a very personal um, decision. But every time, just bear in mind that every time you pick up your phone and go to an app and type something or you go online on your, on your laptop, every time you're going online, people are collecting data about you. They are measuring this data. They are tracking this data and they are using this data for business. Uh, not, only for, not only to give you a very personalized experience, but to make business. And that's the way this business works nowadays. There's no other way to, to, to work. I, I know a lot of people who work in the advertisement industry, the digital advertisement industry, especially. And what they say is uh, there's a movement. We know that because probably in two, three years time, this model will be completely different because of this, all these regulations that I, I, I talked about today. So we know there will be different laws. We know that our data will be more protected we're, we're going towards this uh, direction. So they actually don't know how the business model will work, but of course that they are gonna find some way to have access to our data. So maybe we are going to be a little bit more protected, but personally, I don't see any scenario where our data will not be used in a way that we, it's gonna be a little bit uh, uncomfortable to us at least, okay? Uh, so for today, that's it for today, folks. Uh, thank you, Erica. Do you have any any questions or something? Hang on, not at the moment. Um, but if anyone would like to ask a question, we can either ask in the chat box or um, if you want to chat in person too, we're happy to take any questions. And Ricardo, thank you very much for this. This week's webinar is very interesting to look at. Oh, we have a few questions coming in. Uh, so Vita, is, he, she was wondering if what you thought of the Netflix is the social dilemma. Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I enjoyed the, the documentary, but that's the kind of documentary you have to watch um, carefully. I think there's a lot of interesting things in there. Uh, uh, they're not lying about anything, but they're kind of exaggerating a little bit you know and and i think they focus too much on facebook especially and and a lot of people said that, that it was a little bit uh, um strange because netflix uh they also use our data you know netflix use a lot of our data and um uh, and uh so they were saying well netflix produced this documentary but uh but actually they they actually do the same they don't do exactly the same but uh, I think it's interesting. I think it's worth watching. Um, what they're saying there is true. I mean, you know, uh, there's a lot of things actually that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about in this media literacy series, which is, is uh, uh, you can watch on this documentary. So, uh, but as I said, you know, I think sometimes they, they, they try to create a scenario that it's too catastrophic. So be careful because if you watch that uh, documentary, you might uh, delete your your all your social media uh, uh, accounts in the next day. I think it's not like this. I think I think we have to be, be I, we have to be careful. I think we 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 have to, especially the the most interesting things about um, this documentary. I think is the amount of time that we spend, you know, on 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 social media platforms and how they create. A beautiful design to keep us connected all the time, you know, and come back all the time. 
So, uh, so yeah, so I, I really enjoyed, I really recommend to people when people ask me about that, I say, watch it. It's very interesting. Just be careful because sometimes it, they exaggerate a little bit. Thanks, Ricardo. And Sam is asking the question, are banks doing the same things with our credit cards when swiping? Uh, the same things with our credit cards when swiping. I'm not sure about that, actually. Um, you, you, I think he, 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 he means that, you know, every time we, we use, uh, every time we use our banks, the banks know that we, we are using the cards. Is that, is that the question? Because yes, of course. I mean, every time we use the cards, the bank has this detail. I'm not, I'm not sure if they are sending this information to third party companies you know uh, uh, i don't think so I, I think they can't do this kind of things banks so sam sorry sam just wants to clarify means tapping in the shop so when we're you know um tapping a payment um in shops i suppose tracking us that way yeah i mean every time you use your card or if, even if you're tapping with your phone your bank knows this you know so these details they know but i i, I don't know exactly what they're doing with your information i think they don't have the right to to give out this information to third parties. Um, no, I don't think so. But um, but what, what maybe what 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 we we could explore here is that, for example, if you if you are using your mobile phone to pay for something, then it's not only the bank involved in this transaction. I mean, we're talking about, for example, if you have an iPhone, we have Apple also involved in this transaction. So then Apple might know that you are, you know, spending money on something and it's going to use this information uh, to sell this to advertisers, not, not sell the information, but sell your, uh, your profile based on this information to advertisers. Yeah. Thanks, Ricardo. Bunny asks, do you service the claim not to track like such, for example, DuckDuckGo as an example, do they really have to hold their claims? I believe so. I mean, uh, uh, everyone says that DuckDuckGo is pretty uh, uh, reliable. Again, this, this is such a very difficult topic because we don't know exactly what these people are doing with information. You know? Because the information uh, does, doesn't disappear out of nothing. You know, These guys, these corporations, they have thousands and thousands of computers storing information about us. So basically, it's about believing. So I believe, you know, if they say they're not selling my information, I believe in that. Uh, but are they deleting this information? Are they storing in some safe place or not? What are you actually doing with this information? We don't know. I've heard a lot of good things about DuckDuckNo. Uh, I think they are they are very reliable. So I, I would trust, yeah. Well, that's good to know. And Jan has a, a big question here. Do you think democracy is in a good place to deal with the strain being placed upon it by social media and influencing voter behavior? Can democracy survive the internet? Right. <laughs> well, yeah, we. I think we need about five webinars just to talk about <laughs> democracy today. Uh, I, to be honest to you, um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite pessimist nowadays, you know, with, with the, the direction things are going um, because we, I have seen many, many problems. I'm from Brazil, so uh, I've, I've seen problems in Brazil with the, the, the last election we had two years ago, uh, whereby politicians used a lot of fake news through, uh, especially through WhatsApp, you know, to, to spread so much disinformation, so unbelievable. So the actually, <laughs> I think people, are people seeing me or, yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, so I think that uh, I think we are, we are in a very sensitive moment right now, and um, and I think yes, democracy can survive the internet. Uh, I, I'm I'm not sure if I'm saying this because I I believe in this or because I want this, uh, but yes, I think democracy survived the internet. But of course, that we need to change a lot of things. That's that's the. That's the big point. We need some kind of regulation. And regulation is a very uh, difficult topic because like we need regulation, but on the other hand, we can't afford, for example, give up um, uh, freedom of expression. You know, freedom of expression is very important, but can you, can you say absolutely anything when you are online? Can you say anything when you are on Facebook or Twitter? You know, and if not, what's the limit? 
So like we, we've seen over the past days, uh, Donald Trump has gone to Twitter and he, he tweeted a lot of things and then Twitter had to go there and say, well, this is not really appropriate. This is not appropriate. So, and some people are saying, well, but this is, this is limiting his, uh, his uh, freedom of expression because you know, even if it's not true, but he has the right to say, that's a big debate. I think if you're lying, you, you don't have the, the right to lie. I think if you are causing any harm to people, you don't have to write the right to do so. This is not freedom of expression. But again, what's the limit? What's the threshold? So I think the question is very good. I think the internet um, is, is in some way putting democracy in danger. And I think we've seen uh, on Brexit, in American election, on the Brazilian election, and in many other places, uh, the influence that the internet and the digital media platforms, the influence they had on election. So we need regulation. We need to think about this. We need to discuss this very seriously. But let's not give up, people. We, we, the democracy will survive and with the internet because the internet is not going anywhere. It's here to stay. So we have to have both the internet and democracy. That's great. Thanks for that, Ricardo. And actually, um, last week you recommended the game was a Get Bad News, and I was playing with it a few days ago. Um, it's posted up on our Twitter, actually, our Twitter page. Um, and it was it's quite eye-opening how easily you can kind of twist. Um, and I, I mean, we're seeing it all this week, how you twist one small thing and it can be in your favor or in, and how quickly people can actually kind of believe it. Yeah. Um, even when disputed, it's it's quite eye-opening. So here's... yeah, and and lies are shared much more easily than truth, you know. Uh, so and we have our confirmation bias as well. So mm -hmm. we need we you know we we always want to interpret information in a way that confirms our previous beliefs. Uh, it's very complicated, Erica. It's very very complicated. It's just it's not one tiny problem. It's there's so many things involved. <laughs> In the, in the way we use the internet and the digital media technologies. Uh, it's, it's a huge issue. And I'm so happy that it seems to me that now people are kind of waking for, for this problem. You know, we are talking more about this in schools. We are here now today discussing this. And uh, this is something very, very serious. Yes, and it's great to see so many people here with us today. I mean, showing that people are interested in kind of learning how to critically assess um, our online activity and, and really what's kind of going on. So I think it's um, webinars like this are a really important part of that. And so thank you, Ricardo, for doing that. And um, everyone, we have his uh, videos from this week and the last two, last three weeks, actually, on our the Dunleary Rockdown County Council YouTube channel. But I will also um, post them on our social media and our library's website. So do take a peek. And of course, this is all part of our ex um, exhibition from Tactical Tech, the uh, Classroom Misinformation Edition. I know some of you have mentioned that you've already been checking it out. So please continue to check it out. It's well worth um, checking out that exhibition. We do actually have the exhibition on the side of the lexicon, um, where our, on the Hay Terrace side of the lexicon, you can see it. It's obviously not as good as being in the library to see it. And hopefully it will still be there when we do reopen, which hopefully, fingers crossed, and won't be too long. Um, but thank you very much for coming this week. And thank you again, Ricardo. We look forward to next week. We still have, you can still register for next week's webinar if you'd like. And um, actually, Ricardo, do you want um, to just to mention next week's very quickly? Yeah, next week, we, we uh, the, the topic is quite similar, but I'm, I'm bringing a, a colleague, Paul O'Neill, who is an artist, and he talks, he discusses actually uh, not only data privacy, but surveillance, which I think is a very interesting topic. So me and Paul O'Neill will be together talking about data privacy and surveillance next week. Great. Thanks a million, Ricardo. We'll see Thank everyone you. next week, hopefully. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>